I, it's a real pleasure for me to actually introduce Cameron Hepburn, who's already asked a very pertinent question, and I hope that within the context of introducing this next session and giving a bit of a prelude and setting the stage, Cameron, you'll talk a little bit about the human risk factor, which is slightly linked, actually, to your question. But um, Cameron is Professor of Environmental Economics at the University of Oxford and Director of the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment has for many, many years done incredible work in this area. I think the Smith School has really tried to unlock some of the very difficult conversations between companies and the environment in the sustainability arena. So I'm, I'm really pleased that you're here with us, Cameron, and I'm going to um, welcome you to the stage. Thank you very much, Sandrine, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I, I did ask a question about politics. I'm not actually uh, slated to answer it, uh, which is the joy of being the professor. I just asked the questions. Um, but I want to start with a question for you, actually, before de delving into the three big categories of risk on the way to net zero. And the question isn't about one and a half degrees. I've asked this question repeatedly over the last two years with a hope that gradually I'd get a higher and higher accurate response rate. And it hasn't been happening very quickly, so I'm hoping that you're going to blow my stats out of the water and this room is going to beat every single previous room. Here we go. So what percentage does net CO2 uh, have to be reduced by from today's levels to stabilize temperatures at three degrees above pre-industrial levels. So not one and a half, not two, but three degrees. I'm gonna give you three options. I want every hand going up once uh, only. So zero to 20% reductions, 20 to 80% reductions, or 80 to 100% reductions of CO2 from today's levels to stabilize by th at th no more than three degrees. So hands up for zero to 20. 20 to 80, 80 to 100. Okay, so we've got about 60% of the room is 20 to 80. Uh, for a smaller room, I'd ask for a volunteer uh, as to why. When I ask for a volunteer as to why for 20 to 80, most people say, well, it's kind of got most of the probability mass, so I thought I'd go there, and it's in the middle, and most exam questions, you know, I know how you guys work. It's the middle answer that's the right one. I'm afraid you're all wrong. So the 80 to 100% lot have it, right? It's probably about a quarter of the room. If I ask one of them to say why, it's kind of 50-50 odds whether you've got the right reason. You might be right for the wrong reason. So some of you will say, well, I don't know, it kind of feels like we've got to do a lot. Um, but one of you or a few of you might say the correct answer, which is that the answer is 100% emission reductions. Now, I hope... If you learn nothing else today, you'll take this away. You can think about this when you're having your bath this evening and reflecting on the conversation. You've turned the tap on, the plug's in, and you want to stabilize the water level. By what percentage do you need to turn the tap off? So now when you turn the tap off determines how high the water level in the, I mean, I'm not answering that because you know the answer to it. So how high is the water in the bath? That depends on when you turn the tap off but you're gonna turn the tap off. If you wanna stabilize at three, it's kind of a high water level in the bath, you still gotta turn the tap off. Now this is a supremely important, simple point. We are turning the tap off one way or another. This is not an if question. We go to net zero, definitely. Either we turn the tap off, or the bath floods over the edge and humanity wipes itself out, but the tap goes, I mean, the, the bath level stops, we do stabilize. So, the question then for us is how quickly can we turn the tap off and can we turn it off before we get past one and a half or two degrees? So let's have a look at what that means. For one and a half to two degrees, we're talking about turning the tap off on net CO2 emissions by sometime within the next 30 to 50 years at a global level. Now you could argue, and you'd be well uh, justified in arguing, that if you're a rich country or a rich region like Europe, you need to be turning the tap off earlier than some of the poorer regions of the world. So this is a very, very rapid transition. Uh, you know, the, 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 
The words that uh, Andrew used from the IPCC are uh, unprecedented transformational change. That's exactly right. Now, many economists will say this is simply implausible. I'm not wasting my time on this stuff. And in a sense, they're not wrong that it's implausible, but it's also not impossible. And plausibility and possibility, it's worth being very clear about the distinction between those two concepts. Here's why it's implausible. Dennis pointed out that the IA did an analysis in 20, uh, 2011 saying that we basically we will have built enough to take us over uh, two degrees by 2017 and then said there was no further discussion. Actually, in the academic literature there was because in 2016 we did a really detailed, properly nerdy, comprehensive analysis of the same question. I mean, the IA's analysis was, was good. I'm not saying it wasn't. Uh, but, but it was not thoroughly comprehensive. And we found that the capital stock would be built the next year, still 2017, and, and, it, and it was. What we've got in terms of existing capacity in the world, if you think about a budget just for the power sector of 300, oh, sorry, 240 gigatons of CO2, we've already got committed in the existing capital stock 300 gigatons of CO2. Budget's 240, so already over budget. And so you would think, if we were serious about this transition, that instead of building new fossil capital stock, we'd be stranding it, cutting it, killing it, wiping it out. We're not. You can see in the light gray there the pipeline of new investments, things that are either financially approved or under construction coming into the system now, another 270 gigatons. So we're already over two degrees, and we're building more. So you can see why those of us who look at the data think, one and a half degrees is implausible. I'm afraid it's hard to disagree with that. It is implausible, but it is not impossible. Now, I'll tell you why it's not impossible. Because the rate at which solar and wind and batteries and all of the other clean technologies are falling in cost, and we've got a whole team that look at predicting technological progress, and find, they're finding actually that it is more predictable than you think. The, the rates of change in solar, for instance, have been pretty consistent for 30 years. So when you, when you apply those rates of tech change, you get to the point of realizing that your clean technologies are going to be cheaper to build new than it is to run your existing technologies. So it makes complete sense to me that quite a lot of that existing fossil plant will be cut off before the end of its normal economic life and stranded. And that is the chance that we have. That's the disruption that we face. That's the major risk if you're holding these stocks and these assets, and it's also, Sondrine, to your point, the human cost that will be paid when people in these industries uh, lose their jobs, which, that, which they will. And it's not, not, I'm not being nasty, I'm just making, it's almost a statement of fact. So the challenge for us is to enable the transition to occur in a way that works so that we can think about adjacent industries, adjacent skill sets, and again, we've got a different team at Oxford thinking exactly along these lines. How do you shift people, given their skill sets, from a set of jobs and, and careers in a particular industry that will be no more, adjacent to other industries where they will be able to have productive and fulfilled lives. I'm not gonna say any more about the physical risk. I have barely said anything about the, the climate impacts because that's coming. So let me instead uh, take a look at the, the economics, the policy, and some of the tech risks that are coming. So firstly, it's not as if there's no response from, you know, we, we know we're going far too slowly but we are going. You can see the growth here in a legislative and executive action on climate change uh, over the last decade or two. And it's also not as if politicians in the West are not waking up and thinking, actually, we really need to accelerate this transition, whether it's France promising a ban on uh, diesel and petrol vehicles by 2040. Of course, if the French does it, the UK uh, needs to do it as well. We couldn't be left behind. Um, the Indians saying, actually, these guys are far too slow. We'll do it a decade earlier. And the Chinese uh, haven't put a date on it, uh, but all the signs are it'll be considerably earlier than 2030 for the bans on fossil vehicles in China. And that's motivated by the robust realistic point of view that actually there's a huge multi-trillion industry here to capture and the Chinese can capture the EV industry if they're stimulating their domestic demand. And then we've got alliances to get rid of coal altogether and the UK is leading one of them. So these bans are coming in. 
carbon pricing is spreading. Okay, we had a slightly uh, dissatisfactory result today with Washington State. The, the motion there didn't pass for a $15 a tonne carbon price. But as you roll the clock forward from 2010 to 2015, the blue is areas with a carbon price. You can see the gradual expansion of carbon pricing around the world, which is what we need. Again, too slow, but we are getting there. And do carbon prices work? Here is the UK power mix over the last five years. Um, we have a lot of the chief executives into the Oxford Smith School. And some of them, 10 years ago, have said, all this green stuff's not gonna happen. You know, I'm investing in my new coal asset they've had to take a bit of a write down because they're just not being used anymore. If you look at 2013, five years ago, it was about 50% coal on the UK grid. Five years later, it's roughly 0% coal on the UK grid. That is a very, very rapid transition of, of, a, of an industrialized country's power sector in the space of five years. It's been made up by gas, so we're not, you know, we're not home and hosed yet, uh, but it's also been made up by renewables. So this is possible. It also was facilitated by the fact that we had a lot of spare gas capacity in the system, but it can be done. And of course, if you're caught, caught out and you haven't anticipated the transition and you're an investor, uh, you lose a lot of money. Here are, I, I referred to carbon prices, here are the prices as they stand now around the world uh, in terms of coverage and scale and price on the vertical axis going, going up to $75 a tonne if you can't read it there. We should be in that kind of range, based on um, work Nick Stern and Joe Stiglitz did with the World Bank Commission. So for the most part, most of the countries, they're not at 100% coverage on the far right, they're kind of you know, a fraction of that, and they're not in the right range, but we are actually getting towards the right range. You know, we are moving up uh, and to the right as time passes. But for me, the exciting thing and the reason why, well, one of the reasons, apart from the great team, uh, I took up the directorship of the Smith School, is that there's such a range of innovation across so many industries. And these industries are awaking and realizing that, you know, that, that some of them are woke. They, they are realizing that actually they're gonna be out of business unless they completely transform themselves. So whether it's the Swedes saying, huh, we need a zero carbon steel process all the way through. Let's stick a whole lot of money into doing that because actually the Chinese are gonna outcompete us on carbon steel, so, but maybe there's a chance for us to have a domestic, globally competitive zero carbon steel industry. Or uh, we could radically improve the efficiency of solar again and reduce costs by using perovskite structures layered onto silicon bases. Or we have a shipping deal 50% reduction in shipping emissions, which is gonna necessitate a complete revolution of how the shipping industry works with radical ideas moving into that space too. And this floating solar park you see there. Now you might think that's a fantasy, surely not floating solar, but that, that's a real photo from a real solar plant. Uh, and you probably would never guess where it is located. It's in the UK. So that lovely sunny place where I call home, I'm Australian. Uh, I've been regretting moving there ever since, no, it's not true. But uh, so, so economic, it's uh, economic solar floating in the UK. Uh, this is just the beginning. The, the, the lumps of aggregate there in the middle, they are carbon negative aggregates that soak up CO2. You might think, well, that's gonna be expensive. They're cheaper than your regular aggregates and the company making them is just absolutely making a mint. Uh, they, they, they make a lot of money, uh, partly because when you take us, um, when you uh, produce these aggregates with CO2, you can detoxify a range of toxic waste. So there's kind of previously toxic aggregates that have been uh, detoxified. Uh, last slide on liability risk, and then I will wrap up with some conclusions, but I could go on for a long time. With these transitions and with the physical impacts, uh, it's clear that people are gonna be held accountable if they don't manage their risk, if they don't disclose their risks. So, and we're seeing a flourishing of legal suits, both in Europe, but also around the world. There's an argument that actually every investment manager can be held liable if they, are, if they don't have control over their climate risks, if they're not disclosing it and they're not managing it. And the reason is, it's, it's a simple argument, it's the following you need to be disclosing or managing any material risk. A material risk is a risk that might knock 5% uh, off your value. And 
it's arguable looking at climate, and the fact that we're on a four to five degree pathway now, that is our business as usual, you will be seeing in aggregate well over 5% kind of damages globally and 5% uh, damages globally to listed equities. So you can argue that even passive um, investment managers need to be thinking carefully about disclosing and managing climate risk or else they could be sued. Now, I'm not sure that this case is going to be brought in one immediately. Other cases are being brought and have been won on more narrow legal grounds. But there's going to be more and more cases on more and more wide grounds with greater and greater chance of success as the climate impacts come in. So let me wrap up. Uh, what does the financial sector, what should we do? Well, the first thing to say is that carbon footprinting is great, but have, a, have your eye on the end goal. Net zero emissions. How does the business that you're investing in make money in a net zero emissions world? Do its products exist in a net zero emissions world? And we launched these Oxford Martin Principles for Climate Conscious Investment focused on net zero emissions, which have been picked up by the Saracen Climate Active Fund, which manages 500 million. And they you know, engage with or harass uh, companies like Shell and other big companies who's on which advisory, external advisory board I sit, so I'm kind of harassing myself there. Uh, to, to actually get themselves into a situation where they can make money in a zero emissions world. So there's a lot of opportunity as well as a lot of risk. So to sum up the three points, other than bearing in mind that we will have to get to net zero, so take that away, it's, it's when, not if. First, we are seeing the physical risk come through, and you'll hear more about that right away now. Second, the risks from the transition to a zero carbon world are pervasive, large, growing, because they cut across almost every industry. Uh, and lastly, with increasing legal interest in the area, increasing lawsuits, risks to manage in that front uh, are growing. And if you're an investor or if you're in the financial community, you need to properly understand those risks and the opportunities and disclose them and manage them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cameron. I think you've set the tone nicely in terms of understanding what those risks are. And I maybe would add when we have John come up here. So John Quinlan, who actually is the CEO of Aviva Ireland and Aviva, who have been incredibly active and really one of the leaders in thinking around climate risk and the link with the insurance industry. Um, I'd like to ask you, John, when you do come up here, um, first of all, to take into consideration some of the challenges that have just been f put forward by Cameron, which I think one of the key challenges is the issue of the litigation that's coming out. We've got Ugenda that actually won their case in the Netherlands. They took the Netherlands to court. They won their case in the high court. And interestingly, it wasn't just on the grounds of environmental destruction or climate change impact, it also, also brought in the human rights aspect. And I think that's super important, so negligence from a human rights perspective. So if you could think a little bit about that when you're, when you're speaking. And, and then the other, which I think is incredibly important, is how do we look at this concept of risk in the meantime, because we're already seeing risk. We're already seeing natural disasters, which obviously you have to think about every single day. Um, and we've seen some of the greatest natural disasters in the last two years and costs. I think it was 3.5 billion in 2017, and we haven't yet looked at the costs in 2018, which should be actually more than that. So I'm going to welcome you up here and um, very much look forward to, to your presentation. I'll exit. So Cameron, great, uh, great speech, great slides, very hard to follow. Um, the insurance industry has a huge uh, interest uh, in the whole area of climate change for reasons that I hope I'll outline in this um, few words I'm going to cover. Uh, first of all, it's great to be here to speak about uh, and bring to light some of the challenges that we as a leading global insurer and indeed the entire insurance industry face as a result of climate change. It's a major strategic issue for Aviva and indeed the insurance industry beyond. We have a collective responsibility to collaborate to narrow the protection gap that you're going to hear that has emerged because of climate change. We've also got a role to play in modelling, understanding, communicating and working with governments, regulators 
and other relevant stakeholders to mitigate and manage risk uh, from disaster recoveries. Aviva is a global uh, leading insurer, as I think you've heard from Sandrine, has been very active in the space of climate change over the past 20 years. To give you a sense of that, we've been a founding signature in the Carbon Disclosure Project 2001, a founding member of ClimateWise in 2007, and the first global insurer to go carbon neutral in 2006. Interesting, when we talk about cost benefits, you wouldn't see it reflected in our share price today. So there is a lot of work that we need to do to bring this to the attention of consumers to create the demand pull for people that we believe are doing the right thing. Although our activity has increased in the last two decades, it's important to remember that managing risk is at the very heart of what we as insurance companies are here to do. We've been in Ireland for over 300 years, and our expertise lies in assessing risk, pricing risk, and advising our customers on how they themselves can manage and mitigate risks. Um, one of our core values is to create legacy. And we hope that through investing with courage, taking appropriate and smart risks, and making good decisions, that we will allocate our resources appropriately so we're here for the next 300 years to serve our customers. Our value proposition is to be here when you need us to pay a claim. It's really important to say that. So in terms of the impact on climate change, it's clearly at the forefront of our minds at Aviva. Our business can be split into three main areas, general insurance, life insurance, and asset management. And all three are impacted by climate change. For Aviva, climate change represents a clear and present danger. At a group level, we monitor this as approximate risk that is not to say that our balance sheet is at risk today, but rather that we are acting today to make sure that we manage the potential impacts on our balance sheet into the future. Again, to be here to honour our commitments. So what are the impacts of climate change, firstly, on the general insurance industry? There are acute impacts of extreme weather events, uh, increasingly in frequency and intensity, as well as the chronic effects of higher temperatures and rising sea levels. It's accepted in our industry that if we reach a four degree world, we will withdraw from this market. Ultimately leaving communities completely exposed to the financial risks of flood, wildfire and hurricanes. As Cameron said, the bath flowing over in a, in a major way. Today, weather catastrophes are six times more frequent than they were in the 1950s. This means that assets are no longer insurable without further investment in building resilience against floods and heat waves, to name but two pearls. And we're already starting to see the influence um, that climate change is having in actual claims. The significant hurricanes of 2017, Harvey, Irma and Maria, will cost the insurance industry 135 billion, with total losses of 330 billion, and the gap being uninsured losses or the protection gap second only to the major earthquake in Japan in 2011, which was slightly higher at 354 billion. Today, 70% of economic losses from natural hazards remain uninsured, representing a significant protection gap, as mentioned. These are just some of the staggering facts that show the impact climate change is having on our economy and the insurance sector. So what can we as insurers do? Our recommendation is to work with customers to make them more resilient to extreme weather. There will be a need for more and more insurance pools, I'll talk about that later, and other insurance solutions, and it's imperative that we assess how we will participate in them. Every dollar spent on reducing people's vulnerability to disaster saves approximately seven to economic losses. Research has also shown that a 1% increase in insurance penetration can reduce the disaster recovery burden by a staggering 22%. With these facts in mind, we need to ask ourselves if climate change will inevitably lead to a greater role for government-backed insurance schemes. For example, in the UK, Flood Re is a joint initiative between the UK government and insurers, of which Aviva is a leading part. What it aims to do is to provide affordable cover for those households at the highest risk of flooding and create a level playing field for new entrants as well as existing insurers in the UK. We've already trans transferred 22,000 of our policies to Floodry in 2017. Um, and we've also removed any additional flood excesses for new customers and for existing customers as they're renewed, irrespective of whether or not they've ceded uh, to Floodry. 
However, this is only in place for personal lines customers, individuals rather than businesses. And if we want to make sure that economies are resilient to climate change, we need to work further with governments to support small businesses and supply chains more broadly. The impacts of climate change are more generally discussed and visible in the general insurance side, but it does pose a significant risk to our life and asset management businesses also. The insurance industry itself is the world's largest institutional investor and clearly has a role to play. Corporates should consider how the risk of climate change will impact their businesses over the long term. In 2015, Aviva put in place our strategic response to climate change, which sets out how we can help tackle this key issue. And there's five pillars. Firstly, embedding carbon risk in our investment decisions, investing 500 million sterling each year for the next five years in low carbon infrastructure. At 2017, this figures out already at 1.3 billion sterling. Thirdly, supporting stronger policy action on climate change, including the ambitious global deal signed in Paris in 2015. Also being an active shareholder on climate risk, challenging companies to look to the long term and also following sustainable practices. Also divesting where necessary. Sandri mentioned the whole issue of retrospective claims. One of the really scary things about the insurance industry is you never know what you've actually insured. Policy wordings can be very, very broad. So we're very, very mindful of doing the right thing, not just in line with the risks that we think we're taking today, but how people might view those risks in the future. Uh, to date, we've divested from 17 thermal coal mining and power generation companies, for example. We saw at the end of Cameron's uh, presentation, uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD, has published recommendations for use by companies in providing information to investors, lenders, insurers, as well as other stakeholders. Aviva was one of the first signatories uh, committing to implementing the recommendations of this task force. Its recommendations are an instrumental piece, we believe, in standardizing and harmonizing decision-useful climate disclosures globally. But while voluntary disclosure is an important first step, it won't get us far enough or fast enough to mitigate the worst impacts from climate change. To be truly effective, the TCFD's voluntary recommendations need large-scale um, adoption with regulators becoming involved and we call upon the International Organization for Securities Commissions to endorse the TCFD recommendations as a means of, for a deeper examination of climate-related disclosures. Aviv is also working with other asset owners and managers as part of the United Nations Environment Programme Finance Initiative, which is a pilot series. The aim of this pilot is to work collaboratively on climate scenario methodologies and then stress test our balance sheet against each scenario. We believe as we refine this process and with board oversight, it will help us make better decisions internally and demonstrate the soundness of our business externally. I mentioned earlier that insurers only represent one voice in addressing this significant issue. There is also a major and significant role for policymakers, we believe, to help mitigate and adapt to climate change. Ultimately, it is for governments to create the frameworks needed to tackle climate change. We will continue to engage with policymakers to support strong policy action. There is also action required from the regulators of insurance companies who can take more action in creating a framework that encourages businesses and customers to embed climate risk into their strategies. Aviva have three main asks of government and regulators which we think are key in driving change. Firstly, to drive demand for sustainable investments by clarifying businesses' duties and educating citizens about the role their savings play in funding sustainable companies. Secondly, to improve information about climate and broader sustainability performance by companies around the world and by funding independent publicly available league tables showing businesses' performance on climate change and other UN global goals. Thirdly, to radically reward low carbon investments by removing fossil fuel subsidies that make fossil fuel investments artificially attractive, introducing carbon pricing domestically, regionally and globally 
and using capital differentiation to incentivize low carbon investments, reflecting the lower long-term transition risk of low carbon investments. So I've spoken about the impact of climate change at a global level, but closer to home, we're far from where we need to be, unfortunately. Last year, Ireland was named as the second worst EU state attacking climate change by the Climate Change Action Work for Europe. Overshooting 1.5 degrees would accentuate emerging problems of climate extremes and damage the economic prospects of our young people. Only by undertaking radical steps today to decarbonise problems of climate extremes and damage the economic prospects of our young people. Sorry, only by undertaking radical steps today to decarbonise our societies can we leave a legacy of a sustainable world for the next generation, which is absolutely key. The Irish government has committed 30 billion to address the transition to a low carbon and climate resilient society, and the government will also invest 940 million under the National Development Plan to proactively manage flood risks and reduce Ireland's vulnerability to certain impacts of climate change. As I mentioned at the start, one of our core values is to create legacy. And without tackling this major issue, we don't see how we can do that. We encourage innovation and are always looking for short and long-term ways to make lasting change happen. Climate change is a real strategic issue for a business today. We recognise that we have a social and environmental responsibility to act now within the communities we operate in such that we can be here for another 300 years and beyond not just paying the claims that we'd hoped to pay, but narrowing that protection gap that we mentioned. I'm now looking forward to moving from talking about risk to experiencing risk. And I'd like to ask Margot Curl from the Red Cross Crescent Climate Centre to join me on stage to introduce a very serious game on climate risk. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, can we have the PowerPoint, please? So, hi. My name's Margot. I work for the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre. Has anyone here heard of the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Centre? Yeah, quite a few. Uh, for all you other people, anyone heard of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement? Red Cross? Whew. OK, so we have a cool place to start from. Um, I am so pleased to be here this morning and to follow these two fantastic speakers. Um, only last week I was at Oxford University running one of the exercises and the players are absolutely fantastic. Um, I was also at an insurance company in the Netherlands running the similar exercises and also they were really good players. So I would like to see if today we can beat all these players and show them what this room of people can do. To do that, I'm afraid we're going to have to move around a little bit. So, as you had already seen, we have this red and white tape. Ah, that's what it's for. Exactly. Um, so, basically, it's to try to come up with teams of 10 to 12. So, that's what we're going to do. And they are cut in the middle so that on either side, it would be fantastic to have a group of 10 or 12. So I would like to invite everyone who's sitting in the back to get rid of all your stuff for the moment. We know you might have been taking notes with your laptop, with your, with your phone. We'll leave them for now. Get up and find a team of 10 to 12 here. I'll make people responsible here for inviting you and making sure you're welcome. So this is you two. If you can make a group of 10 to 12 here. Then we'll have a break here. If you could make a, a group of 10 to 12 here. We'll have a break here, no one here. A group of 10 to 12 here. One break, 10 to 12 here. A break, and the same goes for you on this side. Mirror what they are doing. And so on. So we'll have a few rows with nothing, and a few rows with 10 to 12 people. So if you can make, do the same thing. Find a group of 10 to 12. And everyone sitting in the back, please come forward. Um, could, you, could you clear the stage? Just clear. So if 
if you're in the back, don't be shy. Please come forward. And we'll be creating groups. It's in your own advantage. If you're smaller than 10, you might not win. <laughs> All right. We OK here? We're right now with 14. That's fine. Sit down and then send two people away. That's OK. I will invite two people too. <laughs> here. I, I think there's a, another group. Okay, if you have your group, please sit down. If it's a bit more, a bit less, it's fine. We'll see how it works. Hey, this is great to see. I see your group in the back. Please feel free to sit down. Find your seat. And we'll see what's going to happen. I have a very cool clicker. I don't know what to, to point it at. OK. So this is what often happens. We've seen graphs this morning. Obviously, yesterday, there have been graphs. But if we do not know exactly which scenario to aim for, what's going to happen with great certainty in the future, what might happen, it might be that some information is not actionable for you to take a decision for what you're going to do next week in your own small roles. Um, and, sorry? In your personal life in this particular case, in your, in your work, obviously you all have really big roles and I hope we'll see some of that evidence later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so we've been playing some of these games with some of the IPCC lead authors. Um, here's one of my colleagues at the White House. And today you have the pleasure, <laughs> or I have the pleasure. <laughs> um, so as a warm-up activity, I'm going to invite you to actually pair up in pairs to two people together. And I've found a volunteer who is willing to show you how to, what, what is expected. He's quite brave because he doesn't know exactly what's going to happen. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, so does, has anyone here heard of the card game Snap? Yes? Yes. So basically, we're going to play with an imaginary card game. I have an imaginary card deck in my hands. I'll, sh I'll shake it. Can you see it? Yeah. No. <laughs> it's invisible. <laughs> All right. It has the numbers one to five on there. I'm going to give him half. Can you please shuffle? <laughs> OK, good. <laughs> He's a very fancy shuffler. <laughs> All right. We're going to use our body language. And remember, it has one to five on there. When our body language shows the moment, we're going to turn a card and see the number that's on there. Let's see. Two, three, three, stop. So if you say the same number, you have to be the first person to say snap. You get the imaginary cards, you get an imaginary point, and you move on again and again and again and try to snap as many times as possible. It will make sense, I promise. Okay, so stand up, find a partner. That was it. For now. And go! Hey, cool.
Let's pause it there. Did anyone snap? Yes. yes. Cool. How was that? <laughs> Up, uplifting. Okay. So in case you, I mean, sometimes it's hard to, to see it the first time. What you do is you turn your card. If you have the same number, you say snap and you continue. The first person to say snap gets the point. Now we're somewhat expert. We're going to make it one step more difficult. We're going to get rid of the number cards and we'll introduce animal cards. Hmm. It can be any animal. If you share a language other than English, feel free to do this in the other language that you're comfortable in. Um, and let's see what happens. So now, animal cards. Good luck. Can anyone give an example of where you snapped? Dog. Was there anyone who didn't snap at all? Yes. So sometimes maybe you're talking, one person's talking about farm animals, the other one's talking about house animals, the other one's talking about giraffes. Did that happen? Does that happen in real life? Oh. So now we're going to the last and final round. And we're going to be talking about resilient communities. So, okay, we're here all talking about wanting to create a better world. But what's the aim of having a better world? It's basically so people can thrive. Businesses can thrive where people can thrive. So what we want to hear from you is, what do you think about when you think about resilient communities? No right or wrong answer. Last round of snap. Let's see. West cloud. Word cloud. Yeah. <laughs> and stop. Clap once if you can hear me. Clap twice if you can hear me. Ah, cool. <laughs> All right. Um, so, did anyone snap? No, 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 no. What are we talking about when we're talking about resilient communities? Eee. What did you snap on? Heat pumps. Mm, quite technical. <laughs> Very good. Anyone else? No one else snapped? Okay, oh yeah. Farms. Farms. All right, great. So we talked about farms, and we'll be working with farms in a moment to come. So we have here now the, <laughs> the uh, permission, or uh, even better, the, the, the request to take out your phones and let go of the snap idea. And we can all go to menti.com. Menti.com. And then if you are there, you can use the code 61. 3753, and then type in five words you and your neighbor can think of when you think about resilient communities, and think of words where other people might snap. So if you are very technical, maybe think a bit more broadly, or if you really want to get your technical expertise out there, also great. And then <laughs> we will see what happens. Someone's hungry, I think, thinking about food. So if we're talking about resilient communi communities, did you type them in? And then submit them. So what we see here is a word cloud appearing of all the words you think about when you think about community resilience and snapping and what other people might be thinking of. Now I realize we don't have people all from one sector in this room. So great to see what are the words we can link on and um, really connect on. 
I see people um, miss their morning break and are really eager for chocolate. And I have some good news. For the next game, if you are the winner, guess what? I didn't set this up, I promise. <laughs> no, I promise this was not pre-planted. Um, so there's renewables, sustainable food, there's security we think of. Um, we think of water. Um, and I'll make this um, word cloud available to you, but it's basically a snapshot of what we think about when we think about resilient communities in this room. Very cool. Um, I can't read the smaller ones, but I'm happy to share that with you on your conference app if that's possible and otherwise in another way. So water seems really to be a big one. Thank you for that introduction activity. And with that, we're going to go on to the full game. So, I promise you, there's going to be some confusion. And that confusion is going to be fine. It's designed that way, um, and I hope that at the end things will become a bit more clear. Now, as a few basic rules. So, this is a deliberate distortion of reality, as you will see. During the game, I will ask you not to challenge the rules. After, you can challenge away. Oh, nice, there. <laughs> okay, uh, your decisions are individual, but team consultations are very welcome. We will have four rounds of investment, and a round represents one year, with rainfall for 10 districts. Okay. So, is there anyone with a group larger than 10? Okay, can you think who will be the 10 core players and who will be the very important press people, the observers, who will take note of what's happening and they can report live on the screen on a next Menti slide. 263391. The cool thing is, the press can be a quality newspaper. I live in the UK at the moment and there are some newspapers that are not so quality newspapers. So you can also choose to be one of those, up to you. So if you can decide who's going to be a main player, who's going to be an observer slash, slash press, that'd be great. Okay, and for the press people, please go to this menti.com. Cool. And we'll get back to you if you haven't decided yet. So the rest of you... And... Let's... See who the rest of you are. Gentlemen here said farmers. Here. So all of you will be a business in the agricultural sector. That could be a farm, that could be part of the distribution, that could be part of the milk bottling, whatever it is you can think of, you're part of the agricultural sector. And you are together in a province with 10 districts. Now, you are somewhere in that province but your reach is throughout. So you really make an important difference in your province, in your communities. Your aim is to have a thriving agricultural business. That could look like that. Which leads to prosperity for the people that are there. You're a very cool business, um, very people, planet, profit. Um, so if you do well, the people do well. And that's what a person doing well could look like. That's what people looking well looks like. And then just take a minute, a moment to imagine for yourself what could prosperity look like in your province. Just take a, a second to reflect on that. So that could be health, education, growth, whatever it is you think about. Now there's going to be some winners and losers. The winning province is a team with the fewest crises, and I'll show you how you get a crisis. And if tight, the team with the most prosperity, remember all these happy people. The losing province is the province with the most crises. Now, we, some of you may have seen these already. What do you think these could represent? Crisis, no, that's not a crisis. Future, yeah. So this represents the probability of rainfall in your province, with six being a lot, a lot of rain, one being not very much rain at all. Two, three, four, five, no problem. 
Let's see what happens if we roll it. Eee! <laughs> okay, so we've been playing this game for about two minutes, and it landed on a six, so you're all flooded. Too bad. And again, not staged, I promise. So, each year, I told you we're going to play four years. The volunteers that we have here are going to roll 10 times, which represents the rainfall in 10 districts. This side gets the red die, this side gets the blue die. Okay? So, uh, they're going to be rolling this 10 times, and you're going to have to make a decision to deal with that. So, what can you do as a business owner? You can decide how to invest your money for the next year. If there's a two, three, four, or five, you can invest in regular investment, whether that's buying milk bottles or investing in grain, whatever it is that you normally do. A one, guess what? It's a drought insurance, cool, all right? And a six in this case, guess what? A flood insurance. So, if there's an extreme event, one of your protections that you have invested in is used. Um, so each time a one or a six is rolled, that means you have to use one of your protections. And we'll show you how that's done. If you have no more protection, there's a crisis. Okay, let's try that for a moment. On this side, let everyone stand, regular investment. Can everyone stand up, regular investment? On this side, let everyone invest in drought preparedness. Let's see, let's see what happens. So, to invest in regular investment, you stand like this. To invest in drought preparedness, you stand with your hands like a bucket. To invest in flood preparedness, you stand with your hands like an umbrella. So all of you are investing in drought preparedness. So can you stand up, please? And let us see, let's take one die for the whole room for now, please. <laughs> I promise you they're not. You can feel and throw them as much as you want. So in this case, I have some bad news for you, because guess what, you're all in trouble. There's zero people here that have invested in flood preparedness, in flood protection. So what do we do if we don't have any protection? And <laughs> Call the girl. <laughs> okay. In this game, yeah, Aviva ran out because, no. <laughs> okay. Uh, in this game, what we do, and it's important that the way you do it, they can hear it over there so it's clear for them. And the way you do it in the back is clear over here. So if you're in trouble and you have no more protection for your province, you shout, oh no, oh no, and sit down. So let's hear, everyone has to do it. Oh no, and sit down. All right, so that's what happens when you're in trouble. Now let's say you made better decisions and there's still some people at the end of the year standing like this, every person who's standing like that, counts for one prosperity point. And remember, we want to be prosperous in our provinces. Quick side note, insurance is obviously, as we've heard all along, one of the many options for managing risks. And there's so, so, so many things that we can do to reduce the potential impact of an extreme event. But in this game, we simplify for the moment. So let's play. Reminder to win. It's the province with the fewest crisis, most prosperity, and for all the winners, I did bring chocolate. I don't know how it ended up on the board. <laughs> um, so good luck making good decisions. And all the losers are the ones with the most crises. The first round is going to be a full practice year. Um, this doesn't count towards the end total. From next year on, you get to make your own decisions. So this year, I would like to invite each province on this side to choose one person to invest in drought protection, one person to invest in flood protection. You can decide who that is. And on this side, I'm going to ask three people to invest in drought protection and three people to invest in flood protection. You can decide who that's going to be. 
and we'll see what the consequences are. So you decide, stand up. If you're not investing in protection, you are doing business as usual. All right. So one drought, one thing I forgot to mention because we didn't get to it because we had such a terrible flooding last year is when there's a drought and you are a drought protection, make sure one of the drought protection in the team shouts hero and sits down. Only one per drought. Then if there's no more droughts, you know what happens. Same with the flood. If you are protected, one person sits down, shouts hero and moves on. So let us see for the first year what this district is going to do. They are going to roll them and then show with their hands and show how many dots are on the dice. Let's go. If you're not protected, let's see it. District one. So there's a three and a four. No problems. District two. Yeah, go. Hee, this is six. So, one hero sits down. Okay. District three. There's a one. There's a one. One, bu one bucket sits down. Hero, shout hero. Okay, Can, did you hear that in the back? Okay, next time we shout hero louder, you'll be very proud you protected your people. Fourth year, fourth district. Woo! Show. Okay, fifth district. Let's go. Sixth district. And seventh district. There's a one here. Is anyone still protected on this side? So what do we do? Everyone sits down. Everyone sits down. No more prosperity in this part of the country. Okay. And eighth year, eighth district. Three, let's find you all down anyway. Nine. There's a five. And the last district. There's a six. Did anyone still have protection? No more protection than what happens. We say... Yeah, they know what to say. Okay, so in a recap, every time there's a drought, someone standing as a bucket shouts, hero, sits down. If you have no more drought protection, there's another drought. Everyone says, oh no, sits down. At the end of the year, we count how many people are standing with their prosperity points, and that is the number of points you get for your province, and that's how well people are doing. Team with the fewest crises, most points, is the winner of this game. So far, so good? Any questions? Each individually, you represent a business. This team together is a province. Yeah, that's it. So you represent a business and you work together here to deal with the problems in your province. You all work in the agricultural sector. Okay? Yep. So you only so so the question is once we've used up an insurance, can we add another insurance? Do insurance companies like it when you do that just five minutes before a major storm is happening? Yeah? <laughs> so what we are going to do in this game is you get to make your decisions how to invest once per year. So we're going to make the decision, roll 10 times, and you deal with the consequences. So, with 
that, let's see if the news, <laughs> what, what the news has said. So the news has said so far, oh no, everyone got flooded. Pray for rain, the insurance dries up. Brave government of district, three prevent drought and flood. Cool. So guess what? For the next year, you get to, to make your own choice. How many are you going to invest? Yes, please. Nothing happens, you just stand there. At the end, we count how many people still stand there. That's it. Okay, so you get to take a minute now to discuss with your province how much insurance, how much protection you want to get for this year. And it's decision time in 10, 9, 8. You have to be standing, showing what you're doing at the end. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. And let's see some decisions. Let's see some decisions now at 1. Is this, am I shouting too much? <laughs> okay. All right. I think I might be shouting too much for the microphone. They've turned it down. <laughs> so, it, it happens. I'm sorry for the microphone people. Um, I see some clear decisions. And we have no further time to discuss. We decide absolutely at this moment. <laughs> We're going to decide. All right. Now let's see the dice of the province. Would we like to see what the rains are doing? Let's go District 1. Three and five. Okay. District 2. Five and four. District 3. Five and five, district, did I say three or four? Four. <laughs> six. There's a six on this side. District, six. Five and five, district seven. All right, District 8, there's a 5 and a 6, there's a 6 here, do we hear heroes? Uh, District 10, three and a 6, there's a 6 here, okay, do we hear heroes? Hero, okay. Now count for yourself. How many people are standing with a thumbs up? How many people are standing with a thumbs up? Six? Anyone more than six? How many? Five. Anyone more than six? Oh, uh, how many here? Seven people. Seven prosperity points for your region. Well done. Okay. We're going to see if the news has got some comments. Our province has chosen a very risky but bold strategy with two flood insurances and two drought insurances with the rest of our funds being vested for maximum return. Cool. Okay, we'll get back to the media later. Guess what? Year number three. You have your experience now. Maybe you know how to invest, maybe not. 
Good luck. I'll give you another minute to come up with your year three investment plan. Decision time in 10, 9, 8. And I'm afraid we're going to have to be strict this time. No decision doesn't count. 7, 6, 5. Let's see your decisions. 4, 3, 2, 1. And let's see. There. Everyone's made it. No more talking. Show your decision, otherwise you're out. Okay, and let's see, District 1, what are we going to do? Five and a three. District 2. Three and a four. District 3. Oh, two and... And a five. Stop, stop, stop. So that's three districts done. But guess what? You thought you were comfortable there, hey? No problems. Did you hear about this thing called climate change? Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Did some people expect this? Okay. So what do we see? We've heard it all this morning. We know it all. There's an increase in the intensity and frequency of extreme weather events. Sorry, this is an awful contrast, but I'll read it. Hotter air holds more water vapor, so the atmosphere will hold 7% more moisture per degree Celsius. How many degrees Celsius increase are we on at the moment? One. What do insurance companies want to avoid before they go out of business? Okay, so 7% so more moisture per degree Celsius, and wetter air can thus lead to more of the heaviest range, which we see in some models. This one by the economists, originally from Munich Ray, which shows the increase in weather, uh, water-related extreme events over the years. We all heard these things before. Um, and also, there's an increase in... Um, let me see, 12% more record-breaking downpours between 1980 and 2010 than might have been without climate change, according to the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. Now, what does that mean for our experience? Can someone please open the suitcase? I'm not stacking the odds. All I'm doing is I'm getting rid of the historical probability of rainfall, which no longer counts. <laughs> and we're introducing, guess what? How many sides to this thing? Eight. Okay, a drought is still a one, but a flood is still a six. Unfortunately, a flood is also a seven, and also an eight. So for the next seven districts, we've done three so far, we are dealing with a changing climate. Please, can we see what happens? Can you still stand the way you were standing? Go, four. Yeah. There's a seven here. All right, five. There's an eight and a seven. Six, District Six. There's a six and an eight. I promise you they're not loaded. <laughs> District Seven. A three and a two. Sorry, did we hear? Oh, no. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, District Nine. Four and a four. And District Ten. There's a one and a four. And that ends the second round. How many people are still standing with a thumbs up? Four, six. So add that 
get to your original prosperity points, that's your total. On this side, what happened? Three floods in a row. Hey, I'm so sorry. I mean, this, the, the odds were not in your favor this year. Let's see what the media says. Can we zoom in on the media? So there's two floods and drought insurance strategy in the first round, going a bit risky with a one-on-one -on -one insurance this time. What else? Did anyone feel the impacts of climate change here? You not so much, eh? Still okay. Okay. We want a bulletproof strategy. For the last and final round, we're going to be playing with the updated odds here, but now this time you know. So you can strategize and think how you want to invest your resources. And remember the team with the fewest crises, and if there's a tie with the most prosperity points, wins this game, potentially gets the chocolate. So you have a chance to discuss with your team how to invest your resources. Decision time in 10. Remember at the end you have to decide. Nine, eight, seven, six. You have to stand, otherwise you don't count. Five, four, three. Show us your decisions. Two, no chance to change it. One and stop. Well done for just making it. Okay, updated scenario, let us see, and let us see, Shh. where's the thing? Thank goodness for bells. <laughs> okay, I understand you want to discuss your um, decision and we'll get to discuss it after and see if it pays out. For now, we'll see the consequences of the weather. Let's go. Let's take one. Eight and three. Two. Two and seven. Let's take three. Three and five. Let's take four. Roll them better. Control our climate. Okay. Four. It's five and eight. Five. District five. Seven and one. District six. Seven, seven and three. Three. No, three. No one has to sit down. Three is fine. Yeah. What districts are we on? Seven. District seven. Let's go. Oh, eight. Eight. District eight. One and a six. District nine. Two and a one. And district ten. Four and a seven. And is there anyone left with prosperity? How many points do you get? How many points there? Three. Here, how many points? Two. Well done. Five. Sorry, I missed you. <laughs> Standing there being proud. Everyone's happy in your community. 
So, now let us see. Is there anyone, and we'll do this by race of hands, who never got a crisis? And the first round doesn't count because I assigned roles. So round two, three, four, is there anyone who didn't have a crisis? Yeah? No crisis. A crisis is when everyone stands up and says, oh no, and sits down. Did anyone not have a crisis? You? Did you have a crisis? You had two crises? Okay. Anyone no crisis? So, thank you for summarizing that. <laughs> Some people are natural summarizers. <laughs> Next time I run an event like this, she's coming along with me. <laughs> cool. Okay. In that case, I'm afraid we don't have... Oh, okay. Before we go to the winner's slide, um, just a summary. Would, would you like to share us this summary as a summarizer? <laughs> I think I've spoken enough. You sure? Okay. Oh, no. Taken as a whole, the range of published evidence indicates that the net damage costs of climate change are likely to be significant and to increase over time. From a reputable source here. Thank you very much for that um, addition here. Um, so we don't have oh, um, winners, winners as such, but let's count the prosperity points. Who, despite the odds, had more than 10 points? How many points did you have? 12. 14? 12? 11? So I'm happy to share that I have four bags of chocolate here. So let us go with all these prosperous people. Congratulations. Who else? Okay. I'm going to throw it. Here. And here? Whoops. Okay. Cool. So. To debrief, and I mean, these activities are designed for a purpose. We heard that they start, there are serious games, there's serious stuff that happens. So I'd like to invite you to debrief together. Let's see what we can learn from each other about this experience. Um, and to form trios, so groups of three. If there's a group of four, that's also fine. Um, and just discuss briefly what happened in the game and how is this linked to reality. And there's some very em empatheticness going on in this room. Thank you very much. Okay, so find your trio and discuss what happened and how is this linked to reality. Please. Okay, and I'll 
take the roving microphone here and let us hear from someone in the back if there's anyone who'd like to share an insight. Is there someone here? Yep. Okay, so we have an insight from the back. Insurance doesn't work as a long-term risk management strategy in a rapidly changing climate. Ooh, thank you. Okay, anyone else here? Anyone else would like to share their insight? Here? Anyone like to volunteer an insight? Yeah. We were talking about the fact that on the probabilities rising, it's that you then have to, as an insurance industry, focus on how you can then finance more of the mitigation and adaptation side, because if the risks to your business are that this is inevitable, which it's rising in probability, then you have to look on the flip side to say, how do you account for that liability? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, the only question I would ask is probability relevance in, 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 in if you go to the net office. We use chaos theory all the time. So what do you question is, this is a question rather than a, a reflection, is probability relevant? Because if we look at the met agencies, there seems to be at sometimes chaos rather than probabilities. I will leave that just in the air as a discussion point and find my clicker again. So I know I have to wrap up in the next few minutes. So my next question I would have asked was what is one important way in which this game is different from reality? We know it's a simplification. We said it's going to be a deliberate distortion of reality. I'll leave you to think about that. If there's something where you think, hey, that's really not the way reality works, that's fine. I completely accept that. Feel free to challenge anything. Um, but your last discussion point in the same um, group of three, four, have a discussion about what finance systems um, could be improved to better deal with our changing climate. Climate. So if insurance is no longer sufficient, potentially, what other things can we do um, to, to make sure that we are all prepared for um, and able to deal with the changing climate? So have that discussion in small groups and we'll have a quick debrief. Okay, and let us see if we can pause there. Clap once if you can hear me. Clap two times if you can hear me. Clap three times if you can hear me. Give me an eno enormous applause now. We, we were <laughs> um, so thank you very much for bringing that back to silence. Um, I, I saw some really cool discussions going on there. Um, we have um, another mentee here. If you have any cool insights, 
tweet link that you want to share that we can pull up after the event also to share with you. Feel free also to use the real Twitter. Um, the Menti code here is 173043 if you want to share your insight. Um, other than that, I'm just going to invite another two volunteer, two or so volunteers from the room who'd like to share something. Is there someone who'd like to share something? Yeah, we talked about cooperative and mutual insurance, which uh, ICMIF are dealing with, and uh, where, where poor people can get a cow insured and they'll pay out within eight hours to rescue the cow from a flood, and also to buy seeds. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Anyone else wants to share? Oh, you're making me run. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, run towards me, yes. Um, so um, in our group, one of the things we talked about is... Um, in the simplicity of the game, it was basically you're wiped out if you had, didn't have sufficient insurance. But actually, what finance systems need to do is support the resiliency, so that if something happens, not it's not a complete wipeout. Yeah. So there is something to build upon because the game obviously assumes also that you can reset the following year, and you need some way of actually going. Well, in food growing, you need to be able to have continuity from year to year, but even within the year. You need that resiliency. So that's what the finance systems need to be supporting. Fantastic. I shall happily go back to the Red Cross and other partners to talk about how the finance sector says resilience needs to happen not only through after the fact um, systems, but really how can we build up that longer term resilience? Thank you very much. Uh, we talked a little bit about you you vary the probability here, but that's only one side of the risk equation. So you could also vary the severity of the impacts, uh, and that might also change uh, how you are going to protect yourself, basically. Yeah. So you're saying, basically, if the eight would represent a superstorm, like Haiyan or Sandy, what do we actually do? And if we get more of those, um, are we prepared for that? All right. With that, um, I think we're finished. Uh, thank you so very much. I, uh, obviously, you can all go to lunch. I want to thank you very, very much. And just a personal insight to share from my side. So I was very happy to be invited, Ben, thank you, uh, to come here in Dublin this week. I happen to be moving to Ireland from the UK later this week. So this has been a fantastic welcome. Thank you very much for being part of that. Um, and good luck continuing these conversations in the break and after. Thank you. Thank you.